Well, I need to make sure this. Well, there's a couple of people. Yeah. There we are. Okay, so we're streaming. No, I'm gonna also record. Well, just in case. All right, shall we start? Uh, people on the remote end, please shout if you cannot hear us. Uh, welcome everyone to another edition of the RAT RAR Colloquium. Uh, we are very fortunate to have an in-person one for the second time in a row. Uh, we are very blessed like that. So our speaker today is Jean, uh, Professor Jean-Paul Naip from uh, EPFL Lausanne. Uh, Jean-Paul got his PhD from uh, University of Toulouse in 1993. And he's had quite a career, so I, I, I'm not sure I can even remember all the places he's been, but he's been to, to Cambridge, he's been to Caltech, he's come back to Toulouse, then in Chile as well, I believe. And uh, now eventually he is at EPFL in Lausanne, where he is head of the Astrophysics Laboratory and also head of the eSpace Center and head of the Swiss SK Consortium. Now, you might have heard that Switzerland joined the SK project officially this year, but it's been in the works for a while. So it's the latest country to join the SKA. And uh, John Paul, I think, was the kind of the leader of that effort. And he is, well, he is an astronomer of all kinds, which uh, he will tell us about today, I believe. Uh, so John Paul, over to you. Uh, folks on the remote end, if you have questions, will you please put them in chat or raise your hand in Zoom? Uh, after the talk, we'll do a question session. But for now, Jean-Paul is going to share his screen and start. And if there's any issues with the audio or whatever, if someone on the remote end can WhatsApp me or message me on Hangouts, we'll try to sort them out as we go. OK, I think we're ready. So thanks uh, to welcome me here. I'm really happy to be back in South Africa. It's been a couple of years I haven't visited. Um, since 2017, I think I was coming every year, but then something happened in the world, as you know, and then everything stops during two years or so. I know we're not sure we're back to normal, but anyway, we're back to a more uh, traditional way of uh, working. So yeah, I'm, I'm gonna give a presentation about my work I've been doing and I've started this work like in almost, uh, let's say 15 years ago or so, um, doing mapping of the universe in 3D using massive spectroscopic redshift survey. And here we're using optical data, uh, not yet radio, but eventually I think we, you know, with SKA, we can do basically kind of the same type of science uh, with radio astronomy and uh, with H1 mapping of the galaxies. Right, so here we have an image of the sky taken by an optical telescope. And what you see here is mostly galaxies because we're looking in the extralactic part of the sky. So we're not looking through the Milky Way. And we have lots of galaxies. Basically, almost every dot here you see is a galaxy and it's kind of extended. You could see you have different colors and that depends mostly on distance, but also on type of the galaxies. And what you want to do here, it's basically transform this 2D map that you could take with a camera into a 3D distribution of galaxies. Because we're going to see that, you know, in 3D, you can learn a lot more physics than what you can do uh, by doing 2D. Okay, so that's the layout of my presentation. Um, for First, I mentioned about motivation, what we want to do, 3D spectroscopic surveys. Um, I'd explain how we do that and what kind of the results we can measure. And then I focus on, you know, how you effectively do that on kind of an engineering side perspective. You know, what are the instruments you're using to, to make this happen? And then I give a, a small outlook. 
Okay, so the motivation, you know, started like 100 years ago when, uh, you know, Einstein and other people, you know, tell us everybody, everything about, you know, general relativity and how it works. And what I think it's really important, especially for the young students here to capture here, is that the equation that we see below, which tells us how you link gravity with the content of the universe and, and the geometry of the universe is really key to understanding the evolution of, of the cosmos. Okay, so if I go back again to this equation on, on the um, left side, we have gravity with this G mu nu, um, the big capital one and the small one, you know, th those are tensor um, linking uh, space time with gravity. The lambda is the cosmological constant where, you know, could be something different, but that's how it was written at that time. And then on the right side, we had what we have, what we call the mass energy tensor, T mu nu, where you basically put some quantity in terms of matter, in terms of radiation, in terms of energy, okay? That's the content, that's what you have in the universe, right? And on the left side, it's what's the geometry. So you have a direct connection between geometry and the content, okay? And if, for example, the particular effect is that if you have a big mass in the universe, it distorts space-time. So like a light ray doesn't go straight, is bended by the curvature of the universe. So our universe is curved, at least on small scale, Question is also whether it's curved on large scales. So that's that's a question, okay? Um, and, and so we want, we're using this general relativity framework in our equation today to understand what's the content of the universe. A bit later in 20, 1924, we have the same equation, Einstein equation turned into the evolution of the universe, of the size of the universe. We have the Hubble parameter, H of Z, which tells you how big is the universe as a function of different parameters, the content in, in radiation, that's the omega r, the content in matter, that's omega m, the curvature, whether our universe is curved or not, and then the what we call the cosmological constant, or you know, lately we like to say, you know, maybe it's dark energy, right? And that's another uh, component there. Uh, you have the one plus Z factor, Z is the redshift, but you could see redshift as time. So it's also a time evolution, right? So the size of your universe will depend and its evolution will depend on the on, on time. So what we want to do when you know doing cosmology is to pin down these numbers omega r, omega m, uh, omega k, omega lambda to the smallest value as possible or to smallest precision as possible. And typically, you know, we started like 20 years ago with error bars on those constant of the order of 10, 20 percent, and today we're getting you know of the order of the percent level. Um, but we had a lot of work to do that. So that's the equation. The first measurement came in 2029 with Edwin Hubble, who first measured the expansion of the universe by measuring H naught, right? The Hubble constant, which is, you know, over there on the left side. And kind of surprisingly at that time, because, you know, uh, we didn't know that that much about the universe. He, he found that, you know, the H naught is not just zero. Um, H naught has a given value showing that the universe was expanding, okay? And I like to show this small movie. So I hope we're gonna hear something. Tell Dr. Flicker. It's something he read. It's something he read, huh? The universe is expanding. The universe is expanding. Well, the universe is empty. And if it's expanding, it's going to be a different part. You can do everything. 
What is that your business? Right. Okay. This is a movie of uh, Woody Allen, and uh, the small kid here is Woody Allen, always has questioning things um, because he likes to question everything. And he's right, you know. I mean, you know, if everything is spent, um, <laughs> we might be in trouble. Of course, Brooklyn is not expanding, as the mother say, because we have gravity here, very high um, gravity uh, field. So we're not suffering any of the expansion of the universe. Expansion comes on very large scales um, and, and we can measure it as a function of time. Um, we measure the expansion also by measuring the CMB. So the CMB, you know, it's the relict um, emission of, of the Big Bang at 3000 Kelvin at you know, 380,000 years after Big Bang. And what is interesting in the CMB is that we see those fluctuations. The small fluctuation we see in the CMB are the seed of larger, I mean, of basically us being existing. We need those fluctuations that grow with time and make galaxies and cluster of galaxies and make the whole universe a uh, cosmic web. Okay, so when we look at the, the CMB, what is interesting, and we can see here, it's, it's a very um, intense peak at a given size. So that means all the fluctuation we've seen in the CMB are mostly of this particular size. And this size is basically this fluctuation will grow with time, and we will see this fluctuation in, mat in air, it's in temperature, we measure in temperature for the CMB, but this temperature means also density, and this fluctuation in density is something we can measure also today uh, in the distribution of galaxies. What was uh, interesting in that CMB measurement is that if you do all the equations, basically this, the position of the intensity of this peak, tells you that more or less the universe is flat. So there's no curvature in the universe. And that's really one of the main results of, of the CMB uh, measurement. There's been other measurement in cosmology uh, to probe those parameters I mentioned, those omegas, um, was the measurement of supernovae. Okay, you take supernovae, you measure their distance, because you know the intrinsic luminosity of supernovae. And you measure the redshift. So then you have a redshift distance relation that you can measure with the supernovae. Okay. So in this way, you measure this, this plot here, where you have redshift at the bottom. We have distance here to the star uh, to the supernovae. And you know, each point here is basically one supernova measurement, okay? So that means you can really describe this H of Z factor I was uh, explaining at the beginning as a function of redshift, right? And, and you see it's super precise at very low redshift. Of course, when you go to redshift higher, say larger than 0.6, then, you know, measurement gets more difficult. You have larger hair bars. But if you have many supernovae, then still you can average and have like a medium evolution of the expansion of the universe. Okay, and in this way, basically, you turn your supernovae measurement here into some constraints into those two parameters, omega matter, omega lambda. So CMB are giving you these orange constraint, and the supernovae are giving you the blue constraint here. Okay, and those two basically tells that, you know, we live in the universe which is omega matter about 0 0.3 and omega lambda about 0 0.7. Okay. Um, what we see also in this plot is what we call BAO. Now we'll explain what it, what it is. And BAO is given another measurement 
of those omega lambda and omega parameters. And essentially what you see is the BO numbers effectively mostly constrain omega matter, um, much poorly omega lambda. But if you put all three together, they converge with one model, okay? The error bars are still large, as you could imagine here. I mean, you have, you know, omega matter is like 0 0.25 plus or, minus, plus or minus 0, uh, 0 0.5 or so. Uh, but again, that's a measurement that uh, is dated from 10 years ago. No, we're doing much better. Okay, so what also forgot to mention, which is super important, is what, um, uh, the supernova tells you is that not only the universe is expanding, but the expansion is accelerating. Okay, and that's a bit counterintuitive if you think of a universe full of matter. You see there's a lot of gravity. Gravity tends to have things, you know, come together. Uh, so at some point you could think, oh, well, I mean, if there's a lot of gravity, everything will come back to. Uh, to one, you know, one region or one dense uh, region. Uh, but in fact, if you want to explain uh, an expansion which is accelerated, you need to put some, basically something in the content of the universe and that could be dark energy, that could be modified gravity in the sense that the gravity on large scale doesn't act less locally, you know, the, the law would be in one over r square, but would be uh, with a, a, a power which is maybe one one to the one point five or so. Uh, you could also think of other ways to mimic this accelerated expansion is by having um, a different kind of geometry. You know, we used of geometry in this in a way where you take two dimension. If you are flat universe, um, you do you know. One dimension plus another dimension is basically the sum of two, um, but that might not be the case. Uh, you could have like, you know, in terms of uh, special relativity, the sum of the two, two speed is not the, you know, <laughs> exactly the, the, the sum of the two. So you could have the same thing on the distance scale, uh, and that would be another way to, to solve the problem. So at the moment, there's no really good solution or there's no simple and unique solution that explain the model of the expansion. So the idea is to have more data and more data will means better uh, measurement of all these parameters, omegas. So now let's go back to how we could do these better data with galaxy measurements. So what I was mentioning, when you look at the CMB, you should, you measure this sphere. It's it's a two D uh, projection on the sky, uh, and you see these fluctuations. And basically, the precision we managed to get with the Planck satellite was of the order of zero point one percent in the measurement of those fluctuations. So it's super accurate. It's much more accurate uh, than what we managed to do up to, yeah, may say maybe one year ago or so. Okay, um, what you see here, it's, it's the first redshift survey taken with the Sloan Digital Sky Survey back in 2005 or so, where you see locally the distribution of the galaxy in relatively nearby up to redshift 0.2 or 0.3. And what you see there is the, distribution of the galaxy as forms of what we call the cosmic web, where you have structures uh, in terms of filamentary structures. And here, the typical measurement that was done and that was done up to uh, 2020 as, are at the order of the percent level. Okay, 2%, 3% level. So there's way to improve that. And I think people are now working on it and, and, and really, that's the, the goal of my presentation. So that's the cosmic web. So what do you see in the cosmic web? Um, this is density of, of dark matter, say. This is the position of the galaxy within this density field. So each dot here is the position of a galaxy. 
Um, and what you see there, it's large scale structure in terms of density. Uh, you have, uh, um, you know, highest density of galaxy, and it's basically where you have dark matter. And then you have what we call voids region. So region where are basically empty. If you look at the 3D distribution, those um, large scale structure, the highest density point are connected by what we call filaments. Okay, so all the, um, the idea here, when you want to make a 3D map of galaxy, is to map those things. And from those distribution, you try to derive some numbers. So you take, you start from a 2D image of the sky, which basically it's the angular position on the sky of, of your galaxies, right? And then you take uh, a telescope with a spectrograph and the spectrograph is taking the light of those various objects. There's different types of objects. We're basically looking and you see here the different types of object. We have the red galaxies, so galaxies which are made of stars that are pretty old and they're not forming any more stars today. Uh, well, at the time we look at them, we have here what we call the emission line galaxy, who are star forming galaxy, who are usually look as blue patch of uh, galaxy in the sky. Uh, we have quasars. Quasars, it's, you know, uh, when you have a, a massive black hole at the center of galaxy accreting a lot of matter and that produces a lot of light. And, uh, and so always these different type of uh, object, you can basically uh, measure the redshift. And here is an example of the redshift distribution of the galaxies. Uh, we've been uh, looking um, with, uh, with, with SDSS or, or the, the DCAM legacy survey. So now you have your galaxy in the sky. So what are you going to do? What you want to measure is some mathematical quantity from which you can derive some you know, physics. Okay? And, and so the way you do that, you look at two galaxies. You measure the distance okay, between the two galaxies. And you basically look at the statistics of this number. And that's basically measuring what we call the correlation function of galaxies, okay? So you bin all your data um, by distance, R, and you count how many galaxy or pair of galaxy you have as a function of distance, okay? That's what we call the, the, the correlation function. And then if you do the Fourier transform of that, that make what we call the power spectrum of galaxy distribution. And here is a, a sketchy uh, description of what is the power spectrum of the galaxy uh, redshift distribution. And what is interesting, and it's pointed with all these arrows, is the power spectrum, if you come from the theory side, you can predict it. And the prediction on what is the shape of the galaxy power spectrum will depend on physics. It will depend on what type of dark matter you have in your model. It depends on whether you have dark energy or not. It will depend on the matter radiation equilibrium early on in the universe. It will depend on the very large scale on, on the initial fluctuation or non-Gaussianity non distribution of the matter in early universe, it will depend on neutrino mass. It will depend on the growth of structure. So all the physics you want to measure goes into the matter uh, in the power spectrum of galaxy distribution. Okay, so if you're able to do this measurement and from theory you can make the prediction, then you can tell, you know, how is your universe. The, the little movie that I'm showing here is the 3D galaxy distribution measured by Sloan 
uh, in 2020, okay? And in that uh, distribution, there's about 4 million galaxies that have been measured. And we've been deriving physics using these 4 million galaxies. Um, and I explain how. So I mentioned the baryonic acoustic oscillation. So what is this effect? So as I say, in the early universe, you have the density fluctuations and they propagate, you know, like an acoustic wave. That's what you see uh, in, the, in the CMB. You have, you have this acoustic peak. Uh, that's at redshift 1000 or so. But now if you're looking at the galaxy distribution, you know, this typical size, it's also casted in the galaxy distribution. And so you're looking at region in the, I mean, at, you know, uh, and I mean, this circular region in the galaxy distribution. So, uh, of course, you don't do that, you know, straight by looking at the data, you measure this correlation function, then you transform it in, in, the, in, a, in Fourier space, uh, and then you do your measurement. So what you measure today is that the typical scale at which you uh, see this, you know, uh, typical shape is about 140 megaparsec. Okay, and that's basically allow you to measure two things. It measure what we call the H of Z, which I'm show before, and the D of, of Z, which is basically it's a it's a 3D measurement. H of Z is a longer of a line of sight, and D of Z is a, an angular uh, distance measurement. And so by measuring these two, you can measure the expansion of the universe. Uh, okay, sorry, my, my text is a bit uh, cr crampy here. Anyway, the other thing you measure <clears throat> by looking at the uh, galaxy distribution is not only the BEAO, which is at large scale, 140 megaparsec, but you can go down to smaller scale. And at smaller scale, typically below 50 megaparsec, you have what we call the redshift space distortion. And here, gravity starts to be important. On large scale, 140 megaparsec, you're essentially uh, sensitive to the expansion of the universe and the accelerated expansion. At smaller scale, you know, more, lower than 50 megaparsec, you start to be sensitive to gravity, so model of gravity, because it's at this case that gravity is important and is dominating. So that means if gravity is important, it means the velocity of your galaxy is sensitive to you know, the global uh, gravity field, okay? And so if you have an over density, then gravity will try to pull everything to the center of this mass density. So that means you will have a flow of galaxies towards the center if you have an over density, if you have a neutral density, the galaxy will flow opposite to the center of the under density. And if you have in what we call a nonlinear structure, so basically a structure where the density is very high, then the galaxy's velocity will basically uh, be completely uh, linked to that structure. Okay. So that would be the shape of your system in real space. But of course, when you look at the 3D, you're not looking in, den in distance, you're looking in redshift space. And redshift space is basically the sum of a distance plus the velocity effect, the mean velocity of the galaxies, right? So that means if you are a northern dense region, if you look at something circular in, in real space, in redshift space, it will be elongated along the line of sight. If you are looking at a dense region, in real space, it will be circular, but in redshift space, it will be, uh, you know, going, uh, you know, stretch on, on, on that side. And if you have a cluster, it will be very elongated because the velocities at in cluster is very high, like 1,000 kilometers per second. 
and that's the if this effect is what we call the redshift of God effect. So that's basically what you see when you look at the data, and when you look at the um, um, uh, at the correlation function of the, the galaxy, so the distance between two galaxies, and you look at the density of of those you know pairs of galaxies, and in red. There's a bit of distortion because uh, it should be wrong. <laughs> uh, that's what we call the BO ring. Okay. And that's the BO feature I mentioned at 140 megaparsec. And below, you have the gravity effect that is squeezing the distribution in, in this 2D uh, representation. And in the center, you have a lot of you have this very massive uh, system clusters, and then you have this figure of God effect that is shown here in blue. So that's all the data you get when you do the this 2D uh, representation of the distribution of galaxy, you know, just in one plot, basically. So with this galaxy redshift distribution, you, you can basically make two plots. Um, this BL plot, which tells the expansion rate of the universe as a function of redshift. Okay, you could also see that as uh, the, the distance redshift relation. Okay, and you can measure this growth rate, which basically will depend on your gravity model. Okay, and that's really two uh, independent measurement you're doing because the, the one, the, the BO one is basically you measure your distribution of galaxy on large scale you know, 100 megaparsecs and higher. And the redshift this distortion is basically you do measurement at scale below than 50 megaparsec. And it's area where you sensitive to gravity. So now, have we basically been doing this measurement? Well, Galaxy Redshift Service started with Hubble in 1930s, at least here, number of, of, of surveys. Um, and, and what you see here, basically, it's a plot where you have area on the sky. Here you have density of spectra that has been measured. And of course, in diagonal here will be the number of spectra effectively measured, right? So at the beginning, we were not measuring that many redshift at a given time. So we can only do, uh, you know, a, a small number. So here we have, you know, 1,000. Yeah, oops, let's, let's go, not to go fast. Um, Galaxy Redshift Survey. And with time going on, you know, people doing uh, better uh, instrumentation, then you can do better, uh, a larger number of surveys of, of redshift measurement. The Sloan Digital Sky Survey uh, that you see here, that's the Sloan telescope. Uh, I explained those plates after, are basically of the order of millions of redshift. Okay, and effectively in 20 years or so, 18 years, uh, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey measured about 4 million redshifts. Now we have entered a different area uh, with the DAISY uh, project. DAISY has been starting observing last year and it has already captured 10 millions of redshift already. So in one year, he has done more than in 18 years before. Um, but I guess that's the way for. But in a couple of years with SK and other uh, surveys that I will present, we expect to reach, you know, hundreds of millions, if not billions of redshift survey. Okay, so a little work on the Sloan telescope and the both spectrograph. Uh, that's the way it was working. We had this uh, aluminum plate where people were drilling holes. And then we have, you know, people putting these fibers onto those holes. And then you have like in one exposure, typically 1000 observation. And you do that, you know, 10, eight, nine times a night. And at the end of the, the night, you have like, you know, at best 8000 measurement, right? So that was the speed you could do uh, with, uh, with the Sloan telescope. Um, so that means in 18 years, you can do 4 million redshifts. If you want to do better, well, you have your change your system because 
you know, with such a system, you, you can go very fast. Okay. Um, so here are the results and the representation of what we achieved in 18 years of SDSS. And what you see here is the correlation function measurement, where you see the year, what we call the BAO peak in the galaxy uh, correlation function. And we have different sample of galaxies here. So the low redshift one to the highest redshift one uh, that are being colored in this way here. Uh, over here, you have the CMB. And here is the re representation of where are the galaxy we measured against the CMB distribution. Okay. And all the, this data is about 4 million galaxies measurement. So what are we measuring? We're measuring, and that's measurements, okay? Uh, the expansion history, that is basically these H of, H of Z and DA of Z as a function of redshift. And you see that the measurements are quite good. They're consistent with the Planck CMB. And in terms of uh, omega M and omega K measurement, you see the different measurements uh, and we're basically converging here to a, a universe which is really flat, okay? Uh, with omega m equals 0 0.3. That's the gross of structure measurement essentially coming from the RSD measurement. And again, you're consistent with the Planck CMB. And if you try to have a model with dark energy, Basically, you see that it's constant with a W of minus one, which means uh, cosmological constant. If you are testing with different gravity models, basically you show you know, you're consistent with general relativity. So it basically all you know, consistent with this lambda CDM model. Um, this is a bit of the, some of the same thing. Um, what is still a bit puzzling in this cosmology measurement is what we call this H naught tension. H naught can be measured either from CMB, but it can also be measured with supernova lo locally. And there's a tension between uh, those two numbers. CMB is favoring 69 kilometers second per megaparsec. Uh, local measurement of supernova is um, you know, preferring like 74 kilometers per second per megaparsec. So there's a big debate of how oh, you can reconcile those two. Um, sadly, BEO measurement cannot reconcile this um, because we're not really sensitive on the effective value of H0, but more on the variation of H of Z. Okay, so then, BAO alone, it's just giving you these, you know, very blue extended contours. So, you know, showing you, you know, we're not sensitive, sensitive to H0. It's only if we combine with, for example, bionic, uh, um, BBN bionic, uh, um, uh, can you help me? Anyway, uh, or, or with local measurement that we can decide of what's the value of H0. Okay, let's just continue. Yeah, so I mentioned the large scale structure and that's basically all the measurements that I've shown were focusing on, on the density part, on the high density part of structures. No, I can show now, and that's something we have developed at EPFL, that we can also do measurement using voids. Okay, um, you would see, you know, naively you can see those are complementary. Uh, and if they are complementary, the idea is that if you combine those two, you get a, an even better measurement. Okay, and how you define a void? And there's many ways to define a void. And the way we want to define it, uh, and that's what we use in our group, is we define it as a mathematical way. Uh, and for that, you basically take four galaxies, four galaxies defining a sphere a unique sphere, okay? And then you say, okay, what are the characteristics of these spheres? It's basically its center, 
and its radius. So with four galaxies, you know, whatever four galaxies in the universe, you can define a center of your sphere and a radius. Okay, and then you can look at the, these populations of spheres in the universe. Uh, they will have different radius. Okay, and you can look at the statistics and through the correlation function uh, of, uh, of the statistic or of the center of the spheres, you can also derive some BO measurement. So that's what we've been doing. And uh, those are started in 2016, those first measurement also from the Sloan data. And so you see here a BAO peak computed from the correlation function of the center of those spheres. Okay, but to do a measurement, you have to basically decide of what kind of sphere size you, you want to do. Uh, and then you can also predict on the theoretical point of view, what will be the measurement. And then you compare to theory and that does give you a measurement of the BO. Effectively, you can see those spheres of different kind. The small spheres are more sensitive to the large scale structure, so the high density region. The large spheres are, are more sensitive to the under density region. Okay. And here you see the density field. And that's the size of the sphere. So small spheres are here, large spheres are here. So small spheres are really probing higher density region. Uh, large spheres are, are probing lower density, okay? And depending on the size of those spheres, of those voids, you have different expectation in terms of the uh, the the intensity of the BO peak, okay, and you can make a, a signal to nose measurement. This would be uh, the signal. This would be uh, sorry. This would be the the noise, and that's the signal to nose. So you, if you go to spheres of the order of say 16, 18 megaparsec in size, it's here where you have the highest signal to nose. Okay, and then you can combine these uh, voids or spheres uh, correlation function to the normal correlation function, and you can combine them, and that basically make a, a better measurement of your correlation function. And here, in particular, you know, it's shown the, the distance as a function of redshift. So you make an improvement in this way. Very recently, and that's why I'm showing that, We've been able to do this measurement using quasars. Uh, it's a bit more difficult because quasar density on the sky, or at least in our current catalog, are not very high density. So it's a bit uh, more difficult, but we managed to do this type of measurement using 347 quasars, which came from the uh, SDSS catalog. And here I'm just showing the results. Um, so at the top plot is just the, uh, quasar, uh, the quasar correlation function. So just looking at high density region. And the bottom plot is when you do the correlation with those uh, void spheres. There's no improvement in the data, uh, mostly because you know there's probably not enough quasars uh, to improve the data. So what's next? Um, so very quickly, you need better instrumentation. And that's what we've been putting in the DAISY project. Uh, DAISY is basically replacing this system by a robot. So each fibers is basically uh, moved with a robot. Um, and that's the, the robot structure. Uh, it's made of two motors. And it basically uh, can all the fibers and basically place it at a different position in the focal plane. If you have lots of robots together, you can have lots of fibers. And this is 500 robots. Uh, the picture uh, have five, 500 robots out of 5,000. And so you see the mechanical part here. And here you have all the electronics 
and the fibers uh, that goes behind into the system. That's the focal plane, which is about one meter size which, with 5,000 robots. And the system now has been working for more than a year now and is producing uh, at maximum 140,000 redshift per night, okay? Compared to, you know, 8,000, 9,000 with SDSS. So it's really a huge improvement. Um, and that means you're gonna measure a lot more galaxy in, in, in um, eventually. So when the, you take the light from with the fibers from your galaxy, then it runs into this spectrograph. That's just to give you an idea of uh, how big these things are. So you have one guy here. Uh, all this is just one spectrograph. And you basically, here you have three in the row and below you have another three. And eventually you take a data, okay? So you have this 5,000 position and for, you know, at the center of each, well, at the center in, within a circle of one of these robots, you can make a measurement. And basically you use three different uh, spectrograph, uh, one blue, one green, and one red that give you the light from the blue side up to the near infrared side. And from that data set, you can measure the redshift of your galaxy. Um, in January this year, we reach a bit more than 10 million measurements. And this is like the you know, cone view of uh, a part of the, the data uh, that tells you how the galaxy are uh, distributed. The galaxy here are different colors because they are of different types. Uh, so the blue, the white one have been selected to be nearby. Uh, the red one have been selected to be, be further. That's the red galaxies. And the thing in, in, in green are uh, selected galaxy uh, being a star forming uh, galaxy and they're much more extended in redshift. So that's the, the current um, progress. Uh, it's the Moore law. You probably heard of the Moore law in, in computing. We can make a Moore law for uh, redshift surveys. And basically it works pretty well that every 10 years you make 10 times more measurement. Okay, so uh, we are about, you know, 20, uh, 2020 or so, 2025, uh, we expect to reach 30 million redshifts. Um, there's about 140 billion galaxies in the universe. So by 2061, we will cover it all, hopefully, <laughs> maybe, <laughs> we'll see. But just to give you an idea that, you know, it's not too far in the future that we could possibly survey every galaxy in the universe. If we keep up with the model, which is, you know, may maybe not happening because it's, it may start to be complex at some point. So why we would do more than what we know today. Well, that's an interesting plot where it gives here the uncertainty in your power spectrum, the delta P over P. Okay, P is your power spectrum, delta P is, is the error on the power spectrum measurement as a function of object, okay, of number of galaxy you measure. The three points you see here in red and blue and, and green, green are what is expected uh, when DAISY, the DAISY project is finished. So around 2025 or so, okay? And you see the error on the power spectrum, it's, it's good, you know, it's below, you know, 10%. Uh, in red, you even below, uh, sorry, you below the percent level, but, you don't have all your information in the, your power spectrum because you still have some errors in it, okay? And what you see, the curves here are for three different redshifts. And, and you see all these precision on your power spectrum goes with the number of objects. And you see that at some point, um, if you reach more than 100 million galaxy, um, basically, uh, your measurement error 
is saturating in your power spectrum just because you know of of short noise so if you manage to have some system that can produce 100 millions redshift then basically you should know um, everything in the power spectrum so of course you know it's your power spectrum here is described by a number of physics uh, elements um, of course, if you have better physics, maybe you can do even better in terms of, um, of measurement. But anyway, that's motivating basically to go a bit further than what we have today. And so we have a number of projects coming up uh, that will basically help in this direction. And what I want to focus is the last line, the Megamapper MERSC WUST survey, which people are thinking about. Um, because it's also optical data uh, and, and how you manage to do that, okay? And so there's uh, this Megamapper, it's a US project, MUST is a Chinese project. They want to build a 6.5 inch telescope. White field spectroscopy telescope is a European project. Uh, and here the goal is to have 10 to 12 meter telescope. But if you want to do, you know, such big improvement, you need also to change your operating system. So that's the robots I was describing. And DAISY has 5,000. The next generation, we are thinking of making 25,000 robots in like a 1.2 meter diameter uh, focal plane. So there's been some papers in the literature. This is a description of the mega mapper. Uh, with an estimated cost. Uh, so you see the project is not cheap, but it's not impossible, uh, 140 million US. That's the interesting fact that the Chinese have already started the project. Uh, they found a mountain in the Western China, they erased the top, now they're building the telescope. Uh, they already have the mirror, so things are moving. And that's the Molo I was showing before. Uh, Daisy, you know, reaching 10, 50 million redshifts. And the next uh, step is basically project like Megamapper, where you're going to reach a couple hundred millions of, of objects by, you know, 2035 or so. WST is doing kind of similar things, but they also want to have an IFU at the center of, of the telescope. Uh, so they'll do uh, also a bit different signs. So let's get on to uh, the robots. So robots are 2D two, two um, moving uh, fibers. Um, they're very elongated because you have to put motors in the system. So you basically you have one motor here is, that's turning this, uh, this upper part. Uh, and then you have a second motor here who's turning uh, what we call the beta arm. So you have two degree of freedom to place your fiber at a very accurate position where we need to reach like micron precision. Fiber is under micron and you want to reach basically five micron positioning of your uh, fiber. Uh, so that's all it worked. You have these two arms, every robot are next to each other and basically you can uh, survey uh, what we call a patrol field. The patrol field is either a circle or a donut, but if you pack all these circle or donut together, you basically cover the full focal plane, either one time, that's the yellow, two times, that's the green, three times, that's the red, or four times, that's the blue, depending on, on the, you know, the, the size of the two arms. At EPFL, we've been developing lots of these fiber positioning system. Um, the smallest one is this one. We've been developing seven millimeter in diameter, uh, but we also worked with the Swiss company and developed this 9.5 millimeter diameter in size. Uh, and with another company in Japan where we managed to do a 5.5 millimeter uh, uh, robot. Although, this one is probably too fragile to, to work. Um, we also been working with LBNL in, in the US to develop what we call the Trillium, um, which basically has 6.2 millimeter in size. 
6.2, 6.3 millimeter in size. We also work with another Swiss company to make things modular. So we have a modular system. The modular system can hold 75 robots all together. Um, so you have a mechanical part here. You have some electronics here. You have some connectors because we want to have a solution which is very modular. Um, this is just design, but we hope to have that ready by as a prototype by next year. And then the idea is to have these different modules onto your focal plane that you can plug and play. Uh, and you can remove them if, you know, if they're not working or if something needs to be repaired. And you have these many triangles in your focal plane. Um, you know, each module is maybe 75 robots uh, and you populate with like 300 uh, plus uh, uh, of the system. And then you have like 25,000 uh, fibers. Okay, that's the end of it. I, I can't say more, but uh, that's the current status of this optical redshift survey. And typically by you know, 2035, if all these three projects I mentioned goes forward, we'll, we'll get basically 1 billion measurements of redshifts. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. Great talk. I saw we already had a question in chat from one of the remote participants. Sorry, if you want to unmute yourself and ask a question, go ahead. Otherwise, I will read it out for you. Yeah, I, I'm unmuted. I can ask. Hi, um, thank you for the clear talk, JP. Um, I was wondering about the voids. Uh, this is where there is an absence of optical sources over a region. So how do you account for the galaxies that are present but can't be observed due to dust obscuration? Well, that, uh, in, in, in the universe, when we look at these voids, usually it's not due to dust obscuration, right? Um, so, and there's still galaxy in those regions. Uh, at least uh, we, we, you know, we're not probing really completely empty region here. We, probing under dense region. So we still have, you know, a number of galaxies there. So it's not like we're looking into the dark. We really have, a, you know, real galaxies, but just there's much lower density. And, and if you have a low density, it means the sphere we're computing out of these four galaxies, you know, will be much larger because it's a kind of a direct link of density measurement. You see? And it's, it, it's a statistical measurement. So even if you have obscuration, I mean, the obscuration would be, you know, not dependent on your density. It will work, you know, in a similar way, whether you are high density or low density. Well, thank you. There's a question there. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So luckily, 
we designed the electronics to minimize the crosstalk. So each robot are really independent and the you know uh, electronic noise it's sufficiently low that there's no interaction between uh, robots so we're fine here uh, and then the other question whether you know there's a failure um, there's different way either the for example the motor doesn't work um, so we can notice that because you know it doesn't move uh, we have a camera that looks at all the fibers so we can move every motors, every positioners, and we can see if things are moving. So we can identify uh, which of the robot will, you know, is not working. So if it's parked at a position, there's no collision with the next one, then we just don't use it anymore. And in fact, we still use it, but looking at the sky because we need also calibration of, you know, what's the sky measurement. So it, it's it's not used for galaxy measurement, but it will be used for sky measurement. So not completely lost, in fact. Um, if it's stuck at a position where neighboring object or neighboring fibers could be, you know, a problematic in their movement, so we have to adjust the way we move, we move the nearby fibers, so not to collide with that particle fibers. So it, it's a lot of you know uh, computing, but we can handle things. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. We have a request to repeat the question. Okay. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so is the question. Okay. So I, I guess the, the question was about, you know, when we look at, at the stars, we can see them moving. I mean, you know, after a couple of years, usually. Um, and then, you know, is it the case also when you look at galaxies, right? Um, so the stars are moving effectively. I mean, the, the star motion for nearby star can be up to like, you know, a few arc second per year. So that's not something you see by eye, but that's something you can record on, on the telescope. If you look at galaxies, which are much more further, basically they don't move, okay? Um, effectively, they're moving. I mean, we can measure their velocity along the line of sight. Uh, and those could be um, compared to the Hubble flow because the Hubble flow is the expansion of the universe. But compared to the Hubble flow, uh, a galaxy could move at you know, 1,000 kilometer per second. But 1,000 kilometer per second, when you are, you know, billions of, well, millions or billions of years away, basically, it's, it's not seen on our telescope. We would need to wait like 100 million or 100,000 or 100 million years to see the movement. And it will be still very tiny uh, because it's very local. So... For the extra thick sky, basically you could effectively see pattern and they will not move. There will be the same pattern today or in 100 years.
Okay. Do we have any more questions from the remote? No, that would be great. Oh, okay. Yeah. Or there's a, a question what? here. Uh, I'm going to come out from the microphone to say certification. Don't be shy. <laughs> no, no. Uh, all right. Uh, just one simple question. You mentioned, I saw the power spectrum plot uh, yeah. that you had, and you had that element. Uh, even if you have like a, a really good number of uh, surveys of the galaxies, but your error somewhat uh, is limited. And since you know the models are quite similar to each other, as you mentioned, because you can have different recipes, like putting in dark matter and not putting in dark matter and all that kind of stuff. Um, my question is really on how do you then discriminate between all those similar models if your error measurement is also some saturated at some point? I mean, how close are they? Um, to discriminate well that that's quite a hard question <laughs> um when when i put this delta p over p it assumes a certain that your power spectrum is de is defined by a certain number of parameters right whether it's you know cold dark matter warm dark matter you know um um neutrino mass whatever so there's a number of parameters in the prescription of your power of your power spectrum okay when you get to close to be you know your delta p over p being you know statis i mean systematically limited it means also uh, it's limited because your number of parameters you have in your model they basically all very well determined okay and and so your the saturation is also because you describe your power spectrum with a limited number of parameters. Okay. If you could imagine other theory with much more parameters, then, then you could go below this ceiling. But it's also, do we really need so many parameters to describe the physics? Probably not, or at least we, at, at today, we, we don't want to put more parameters because we know the physics how it is, and that, that would mean changing the theory. Okay. Uh, so maybe we will we'll be effectively forced to change the theory, but uh, uh, that could happen if you know your data doesn't fit your theory. But at the moment, all the data are fitting the theory within the errors in the theory. Take one last question from the remote end. One would just stand up. So, one would please unmute yourself. Hi, uh, Jean Paul. Thanks for a great talk. Um, I'm just curious to know what is the uncertainty on the measured redshifts that you get typically? So, and is there, the, yeah. And, and the follow up part is is there, is there the, the, the potential to improve on this? Right. Um, so typically the errors on the redshift measurement will depend on the object type. So for example, if you have an emission, emission line galaxies, your measurement error will be very small because you have very strong emission line, which is very well defined. Um, and you have a narrow emission line usually for uh, galaxies. So your typical error measurement will be like, you know, tens of kilometer per second, 50, you know, 60, whatever, uh, 100 at maximum. If you take a quasar, uh, your redshift error could be larger uh, because quasar physics is a bit more complex. Uh, you have broad lines, which are, you know, could be up to 1,000, 2,000 kilometer per second. So then your error, um, you know, will, will be typically larger than for, for a galaxy spectra. Um, but you're really limited by the physics of the object. Uh, so you don't really can go much smaller if, even if you, well, the only way to get smaller error would be to improve your signal to noise. Okay, and, but that's not the point of this big survey because you want to measure as many redshift as possible as quickly as possible. So you, you, do, you don't want basically to, I mean, you gain more in having many galaxies measured at relatively uh, poor velocity measurement, uh, poor being still pretty good, 
uh, than uh, having a super precise measurement of a very few uh, galaxies. So it's not really by improving the precision of your redshift measurement that you would gain in, in the cosmological measurement, but it's more by uh, doing a much larger number. Because, I mean, if you think about it, uh, you know, the scale at which you measure, I um, mean, the, the scale scales that are important is bio scale is 140 megaparsec uh, so whether you individual measurement is 50 or or 500 basically doesn't change so much your ultimate result in the bio yeah no thanks i understand for bio i'm thinking about this for other reasons just curious right. thank you yeah yeah okay I'm afraid we must take our speaker away to lunch. Uh, so no more questions. Uh, but thanks very much for coming, John Paul. Let's continue. Thank you, John Paul. Thank you. So nice people, nice talk again, huh? Thanks. Thanks for whole joining uh, online also. Thanks, thanks everyone. We will see you at the next one. Cheers.